The Mana franchise is one of the most beloved RPG series in all of video games. Its early entries, and especially its second installment, Secret of Mana, are considered some of the best role-playing experiences of the early 90s, being easily counted alongside titans such as Chrono Trigger, Final Fantasy VI, and Super Mario RPG. Mana has become known as one of Square Enix's greatest franchises, easily standing shoulder to shoulder with Dragon Quest and Final Fantasy. It is an impressive lineage, and it's crazy to think about where it all started. An ambitious game cancelled before it could even start development. With the recent release of the Collection of Mana trilogy coming to the Nintendo Switch, and the upcoming limited box version that's coming out August 27th, and is currently available for pre-order and includes a reversible cover sheet with artwork from the original Trials of Mana game, we are being being sponsored by Square Enix to take a look at the first three entries of this series and tell the story of exactly why these games made such a huge impact. Let's dive into the world and history of Mana. Our story begins with a project known simply as Seiken Densetsu, or literally, The Legend of the Sacred Sword. This name and the ideas behind it first floated around the Squaresoft offices in the late 80s and was eventually trademarked by the company in 1989. The original intention was to use Seiken Densetsu for a new game subtitled The Emergence of Excalibur. This project was led by Kazuhiku Aoki. Some early advertisements for the game claimed that the emergence of Excalibur was going to release across five floppy disks for the Famicom Disk System. This would have made it one of the most expansive games ever created for the console. Development for this game did not get very far. According to localization director Kaoru Moriyama, the emergence of Excalibur was cancelled before it could even leave its early planning stage. The stories of the Mana and Final Fantasy franchises are intertwined, so much so that the first title released in the Mana series was a part of the Final Fantasy brand. After Final Fantasy was released in 1987 in Japan and 1990 in North America, the game was so successful that Squaresoft wanted to capture capitalize on the name. They approached designer Koichi Ishii, notable for creating both the Chocobo and Moogle for the Final Fantasy franchise, to direct a spin-off for the series. This new game began life under the name Geminites, but Squaresoft later decided to revive the name Seiken Densetsu for it instead. The phrase Geminites would live on in the series lore, as a group of warriors who protect the source of all mana in the world. Seiken Densetsu Final Fantasy Gaiden released in Japan for the Nintendo Game Boy on June 20. 28th, 1991, and found its way to North America as simply Final Fantasy Adventure in November of 1991. Final Fantasy Adventure was really only related to the Final Fantasy franchise in name only. Internally, it was considered instead to be the inaugural game in an entirely new world created by Ishii, inspired by his abstract memories of childhood. Even its gameplay was a huge step away from the classic JRPG formula of Final Fantasy. The turn-based combat was done away with, replaced by an action RPG gameplay system that looked unlike anything else Square made at the time. The combat system was real time, and the main character has a power gauge that fills during battle. The more patient and strategic the player is with their attacks, the more powerful they will be. Additionally, there are multiple different spells, items, and weapons that can be collected throughout your journey, some of which can be used to clear objects blocking your path. Similar to other action RPGs of the era, each section of the map is cornered off into little squares that the player must move through. The player takes control of a boy that we're going to call Sumo. Sumo is the prisoner of the Empire of Glaive, forced to fight for the amusement of the creatively named Dark Lord. It was the early days of RPG writing, and this was a Game Boy game, so we can cut them some slack. One day, Sumo learns that the Dark Lord has an evil plan to seek out the key to the Mana Sanctuary, giving him access to the Mana Tree, which flows with the power of all life on the planet. Legend states that whoever touches the Mana Tree will be given eternal power, 
and the Dark Lord wants to use its power to conquer the world. After learning this, Sumo escapes and teams up with a girl named Fuji. The two seek out a Geminite named Bogard, who in turn points them towards a man named Shiba to help them in their quest to stop the Dark Lord. On their way to meet Shiba, Fuji is kidnapped, but Sumo rescues her with the aid of a mysterious figure. The three find their way to Shiba, who reveals that Fuji is a descendant of the Guardians of the Mana Tree, and that a pendant she carries is the key to the Mana Sanctuary that the Dark Lord seeks. Sumo continues his quest, intent on rescuing a once again kidnapped Fuji, claiming the legendary sword Excalibur, and defeating the Dark Lord and Julius before they can take the power of Mana Tree for themselves. Final Fantasy Adventure was received fairly well, both critically and commercially. During its initial run, the title sold over 700,000 copies, with roughly 500,000 of these being in Japan. Final Fantasy Adventure averaged a 79% approval on game rankings, an impressive feat given that this was from an era when an 8 out of 10 meant that a game was truly fantastic instead of merely passable. Notably, critics enjoyed Final Fantasy Adventure's gameplay and story, but did note that its heavier RPG elements did not mix as well with its action combat as it could have. IGN explained in their review, the game fails to mix its RPG roots with its action-oriented gameplay. Pulling up the item menu to switch to a different weapon slash item interrupts the gameplay excessively. Square would have the chance to answer these criticisms in later releases of Final Fantasy Adventure, such as 2003's Sword of Mana for the Game Boy Advance and 2016's Adventures of Mana for the PlayStation Vita and mobile phones. Either way, this was merely the beginning of this new series, and these games were only going to get better. the success of Final Fantasy Adventure, Squaresoft authorized the development of a sequel, but gave the directive to move up from the Game Boy to the far more powerful Super Nintendo Entertainment System. Seiken Densetsu creator Koichi Ishii returned as the director and designer, while the game was produced by Hiromichi Tanaka and programmed primarily by Nasser Jubeli. Nasser, an Iranian-American programmer, was an unsung hero of early Squaresoft titles and was considered to be a part of the company's A-team. This new game would be Jabelli's final project at Squaresoft before retiring and moving on. So interestingly, this new action RPG title was originally meant to be Final Fantasy IV, as Square was interested in making a large-scale game that featured combat and exploration on the same screen, instead of sequestering combat into different instances. However, it was eventually decided that this was too radical a departure for the Final Fantasy brand, and instead it became a a different game, Chrono Trigger. As development moved forward, this game evolved into a true Seiken Densetsu sequel. The name Chrono Trigger would be later used for another one of Square's iconic SNES RPGs. This time, when it was finally announced, the game was marketed completely independently from the Final Fantasy series. In Japan, it was known simply as Seiken Densetsu 2, but in the rest of the world it became known as Secret of Mana. And this is the game that is perhaps the true beginning of the Mana franchise. A lot of the features that would come to be heavily associated with the franchise were added in this game, many of which were only made possible because of the jump in hardware. The game was originally being developed for the SNES CD add-on, but had to be reconfigured for the cartridge format after the add-on was cancelled. The development staff originally resisted this change to cartridge, believing that too much of the game would have to be cut to fit on the smaller format. Format. However, they were told to continue development anyway, and much of the dev team's work that was already completed had to be redone. Ishii once estimated that roughly 40% of the game had to be cut or changed in some way, including the ability to take several different routes and get multiple different endings to the story. The plot was changed to fit this new direction, and Tanaka described the original story as having a much darker tone. The SNES allowed for more detailed graphics than the Game Boy, which in turn allowed the artist
artists on the development team to capture a unique style that still follows the series to this day. It also made room for a more robust party system that allowed for more people to permanently join the player as playable characters. Multiplayer was also added despite not originally being a part of the game's design document, simply because the new hardware made it so easy to implement. The gameplay was also streamlined, with each of the three playable characters having distinct strengths and weaknesses. For example, the main character is better at using physical weapons, but is unable to cast any magic spells. Secret of Mana introduced the Ring Command system, a circular menu that allowed the player to easily and quickly change weapons, cast spells, and other things of that nature on the fly. This addition was huge for Secret of Mana, and made the game both easier and more fun to play. The plot of Secret of Mana follows Randy, an orphan from the village of Potos. Along with two friends, Randy explores a forbidden waterfall where a secret treasure is said to be kept. However, while exploring this waterfall, Randy falls off the cliff and into the lake at its base, where he discovers a sword trapped in stone. A voice appears in Randy's head, encouraging him to pull the sword free, but when he does, Monsters are unleashed and attack Potos. The village then banishes Randy for his actions, but he soon meets a traveling knight named Gemma. The knight sees the sword from the lake and believes it to be the Mana Sword, a legendary weapon that can be recharged to its former glory by visiting the eight mana temples. As Randy journeys to the eight temples, he is joined by Prim, who has left her own village in protest of her arranged marriage, and Popoy, a sprite who joins the party in hopes of regaining their lost memories. Prim's true love, a warrior named Dyluk, has been abducted by Thanatos, an evil sorcerer manipulating the Emperor of Vandal. Secret of Mana was released for the Super Nintendo Entertainment System on August 6, 1993 in Japan and October 3rd, 1993 in North America. Despite its rocky development, the game was considered a massive success, with critics praising the game's graphics, game design, and multiplayer. EGM Magazine went as far as to say that they hoped Secret of Mana would lead other developers to add multiplayer in their RPGs. Game Rankings has the original SNES release sitting at an overall average of 87%. Secret of Mana would go down in history as one of the best RPGs for the Super Nintendo, praise that led to the various re-releases for multiple consoles and even a full 3D remake released in 2018. In particular, Hiroki Kikuta's score for Secret of Mana was praised by critics. Kikuta wanted the game's soundtrack to match the visual style of the game, something that was somewhat rare during this period of gaming history. He used art from the game alongside visual inspirations from vacations he took to Hawaii, Fiji, Germany, and the United Kingdom to directly inspire the music. Kikuta wanted Secret of Mana to be different from anything else gamers had ever heard even going as far as to make the first thing you hear when booting up the game a whale call. This stood in contrast to the traditional pings or boops that usually accompanied a startup screen, but Kikuta thought it was important to subvert expectations and let players know that they were about to explore a world of magic and divine beasts. To accomplish this, Kikuta spent nearly 24 hours a day at his office during development. Unlike many other composers, Kikuta created the samples he used for the soundtrack himself, giving the songs a truly unique sound. He used a variety of percussion and woodwind instruments in addition to traditional strings, piano, and synths, making the soundtrack simultaneously whimsical and lighthearted, yet somber and melancholy. Many of Kikuta's songs for Secret of Mana have become mainstays in gaming music, including The Wind Never Ceases and the title-themed Angel's Fear. Secret of Mana's music is iconic enough that it has warranted multiple physical releases and rearrangements over the years. Unfortunately, much of Secret of Mana's dialogue and text was lost in translation during the English localization due to size limitations. The game's English text used a fixed width font, meaning that only so much could fit on the screen at any one point. Conversations had to be trimmed down to only essential information, and there wasn't much the localization team could do to fix it. The English translation was completed in just 30 days, an impressive feat presumably done so Secret of Mana could 
release in North America during the holiday release season of 1993. Despite its technical and translation issues behind the scenes, North American players enjoyed the game, something they could not say about its sequel. With a success like Secret of Mana on their hands, Squaresoft immediately began development of a sequel. Seiken Densetsu 3 was once again designed by Koichi Ishii, but was this time directed by Final Fantasy veteran Hiromichi Tanaka. The characters were designed by notable manga artist Nobuteru Yuki, and Hiroki Kikuta returned to compose the score. Kikuta also once again created the audio and effects for the sound selection, editing, effect design, and data encoding. Like during the development of the previous game, Kikuta spent almost 24 hours a day in his office working on the game, composing, and editing the sound effects. The plot for Seiken Densetsu 3 is structured a little bit differently than the previous installments in the series. This time, there are six playable characters, each with their own personality and playstyle, but you can only choose three of them for each of your playthroughs. There are three main plot lines that each relate to two of the six characters, and the main story you follow is determined by which character you choose first. And though you do not have to pair your main character with their appropriate partner for a storyline, you really should. If not, you're going to miss out on a lot of great exclusive dialogue between them. Our first story follows Angela, the princess of the kingdom of Altena, and Duran, an orphaned mercenary from the kingdom of Valsena. The queen of Altena uses her magic to keep her usually snowy kingdom in a state of eternal spring. However, as her spell begins to fade, she decides to invade other kingdoms to claim their mana stones. She then intends for Angela to perform the spell that keeps Altena in springtime, a spell that would kill Angela. So instead, she escapes. Duran is left for dead when the Crimson Wizard, an assassin of Altena, attacks the castle he is guarding, and Duran vows to defeat the Crimson Wizard. The second storyline follows Hawkeye, a noble thief from a guild of criminals in the Sand Fortress of Navarro, and Reese, warrior princess of Laurent, Kingdom of Wind. When Flame Khan, the leader of Hawkeye's guild, declares Navarro a kingdom, Hawkeye confronts him. He discovers that Flame Khan is being controlled by a witch named Isabella, who kills Flame Khan's son Eagle and frames Hawkeye for the murder. This forces Hawkeye to escape from Navarro, vowing to clear his name and free Flame Khan of Isabella's control. Meanwhile, Reese's younger brother Elliot is tricked by two ninjas from Navarro to disable Laurent's wind-based defenses before he's abducted. Without its defenses, Laurent is attacked by Navarro, which unleashes a massive cloud of sleep powder over the Kingdom of Wind. The King of Laurent is killed during this attack, forcing Reese to make her escape. The third storyline follows Charlotte, the orphaned half-elven granddaughter of the Priest of Light in Wendell, and Kevin, Prince of the Beast Kingdom. Yes, you heard me right, his name is Kevin. Over the years, the Beastmen have grown frustrated by their treatment by the so-called regular humans, causing an evil figure named Death Jester to appear. Under the King of Ferolia, Death Jester kills Kevin's best friend to unlock Kevin's werewolf abilities. Having been made to kill his best friend, Kevin confronts his father over the plan, but is instead banished, and at the words of Death Jester, sets forth for Wendell to bring his best friend back to life. Meanwhile, Charlotte is looked after by her fellow priest Heath, who has been sent to investigate an evil presence in a nearby land called Jad. Charlotte secretly follows him and witnesses Death Jester kidnapping Heath. Charlotte then vows to save Heath and stop Death Jester. Unfortunately, little of the development process for Sick and Densetsu 3 was documented. Or rather, if it was, it has never been revealed or explained in great detail to the public. This is perhaps because despite releasing in Japan on September 30th, 1995, the game never made its way to North America or Europe. And so Seiken Densetsu 3 has gone down in Western gaming history as a legend, a long lost treasure from the era of the Super Nintendo. 
There was simply no way to play it in the West unless you found some type of fan translation or learned how to read Japanese and bought a copy of the game. That's not to say that Seiken Densetsu 3 has been lost to time completely. A port of the game was included in the Seiken Densetsu collection for the Nintendo Switch, released in 2017 exclusively in Japan. And that's the sticker, isn't it? Exclusively in Japan until now. The reason that Square Enix has partnered with us to make this video retrospective of the beginnings of the Mana franchise is because Seiken Densetsu 3 is finally here in the West. Available right now at this moment, you can log on to your Nintendo Switch and purchase the collection of Mana. This set features all three games we just discussed. And on the Nintendo Switch, you can ultimately play it anywhere whenever you want. So if you want to pick up a copy today, check out the link in the description down below. A big thank you to Square Enix for partnering with us to make this video possible. And that, my friends, is the history of Mana.